Okay, so um, instead of taking a break, uh, I think we could probably jump right into uh, our next item on the agenda, which will take us uh, into to, to lunch. Um, it's going to be the Golden Tilefish Multi Year Specification Framework Meeting 2. And I'm looking to make sure that Jose is here. Jose, are you going to be doing the presentation for this? I am. Okay, great. Are you ready to go? Uh, as long as soon as I can share my screen, I will start the presentation. Okay, yeah. Um, so thanks for being here with us today. And as soon as you can get your screen shared, uh, go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Review of the multi-year uh, specifications framework uh, meeting two. And basically, this uh, council staff have been working on developing the multi-year specifications framework uh, for a year, and this is something that was included in the 2021 council proposed actions and deliverables. And basically, this framework is addressing two process-related issues that are minor modifications to the management system. Uh, in addition, we're going to use the framework to set specifications for 2022, 23, and 24. At the first framework meeting back in April of this year, the council selected preferred alternative for those process-related issues. And today we're having our second meeting where the council is going to review the range of alternatives you are going to be finalizing the selection of uh, uh, catching London's limits for the next uh, spec cycle, and then you will be adopting the framework for submission to service. So the first issue that uh, we have in this document is the multi-year specifications. Currently, golden palfish management specifications can be set for up to three years. So what we're looking here is a modification of the process to simply change the number of years for which those measures could be set. So they match the Northeast Regional Coordinating Council stock assessment schedule. So here we had two alternatives, status quo, and then alternative two, which is the preferred alternative that the council uh, selected. And basically the language that you have here in, in alternative two it's the same language that was adopted for uh, soft plants and ocean cohorts uh, not too long ago. So alternative two will provide additional flexibility as the specifications to be set for a time, as I indicated before, to cover a period until a new uh, golden tallfish assessment is produced. So none of these uh, uh, alternatives are expected to impact the way the fishery uh, operates. And here, this table shows uh, uh, the overall qualitative summary of the expected impacts of the current, uh, on the current conditions of the value ecosystem component uh, banks. So this alternative really are not going to have any direct or indirect impacts on However, alternative two is expected to have some uh, to provide some administrative efficiencies uh, as a consequence of implementing implementing that. Advice, advisory panel members have indicated that they support the development of this framework document, and they have also indicated that they uh, in the past that uh, specifying management measures for a time period consistent with uh, stock assessment schedule, the schedules and potentially longer than three years will provide further stability in the fishery. The second issue in the framework, uh, the timing of the fishing year. Currently, the fishing year is November 1 through October 31st. So, this uh, um, uh, framework will modify the process to simply change how the fishing uh, year timing is set. Two alternatives again, status quo, and then alternative two, which is the preferred alternative selected by the council. Under alternative two, the, the fishing year will be uh, January 1st through December 31st. 
So what this alternative is doing, basically, you're aligning the fishing year with the calendar year. Uh, it matches uh, fishing year with the cost recovery calculations that are conducted by GARFO. So we're expecting that this is going to improve the administration of that process. And finally, it matches the stock assessment results or projections, uh, which are based on a calendar year, which the fishing uh, year. So none of this uh, alternative are expected to uh, impact the, the way the fishery operates either. Uh, for the most part, there's no impact on any of the value ecosystem components. However, alternative two is expected to have impacts that range from no impacts to slightly positive impacts on the target species on golden tailfish. Again, because we're aligning the, uh, uh, the fishing year uh, with the way the stock assessment is produced, the results, the stock assessment, and the projections are made. In addition, it is possible that this will have impacts on human communities that range from no impacts to slightly positive as, as, as we improve the administration of this, uh, the cost recovery, uh, the way the cost recovery calculations are made, perhaps there is a possibility that that will have some positive impacts on, on, on stakeholders. But, uh, the advisors have indicated that they support this alternative. Uh, furthermore, the industry feels that ending the fishing year in, this, in December rather than October will create more stability in harvesting the, the full allocation. This doesn't happen frequently, but sometimes October can be a very stormy month, uh, and, and it's hard for them sometimes to plan, and, and, and they might not be able to land their entire, entire allocation because of weather conditions. Now I'm going to move into the specifications uh, component of this presentation. And basically, I'm going to be covering the information that we typically cover when we set our specifications for uh, any of our species. The 2021 management track assessment, then factors influencing uh, recent catch and landings, and then finally, uh, SSC monitoring committee and staff recommendations will be uh, uh, reviewed. 2020, the council set catch and landings limits for 2021 and interim. So we are in the first year of a two year specifications. The interim 2022 measures were set to provide a placeholder in the event that there is insufficient administrative time for the council approval and rulemaking for the start of the 2022 fishing year, which starts shortly uh, in just November 1 of 2021. So we did this for administrative efficiency. In addition, the council understood that they will, they will be using the 2021 management track assessment uh, results to review the 2022 interim value and set uh, values for 2023 and 2024 as well. So here's uh, the current specifications that we have uh, in place for 2021 and 2022. I just want to bring your attention to this graph. It has two rows here where we have the PL and the incidental PAL. So this is currently what is in, in place. And if you add these two values here, the IFQ and incidental half, you get a 1.624. So that's what we're working with right now. Recently received uh, results for the 2021 management track uh, assessment, which indicates that the stock is not overfished and overfishing was not occurring in terminal year 2020. Fishing mortality was 39% below the fishing mortality uh, threshold, and the stock spawning biomass was 96% of the biomass uh, target. In addition, the uh, assessment indicates that the catch per unit effort continues to increase. There is a broad distribution of fish landed, and there is above average year class for 2017, of, uh, about 2.1 million fish. However, that estimate is uh, highly uncertain at this time. There's, the 
the space that this stuff is here. So it will take a few years for us to know how strong that year class really is. So these are two uh, kind of uh, interesting uh, pictures that I like to show from the from the assessment. Right here, you see you see how the catch per unit effort continues to increase at that as that strong 2014 year class continues to recruit into the fishery. And here we have a very nice distribution of categories uh, being landed. And again, you can see how those year classes. This is table one of the fishery information document. I just want to bring your attention to this uh, shaded area here. This is about from the time, uh, this is from the time that the uh, the IFQ system was uh, was implemented. And basically what I want to show you is this line here where it shows that for the most part, for most years, uh, the, the landings have been at or slightly below the quotas that have been implemented since the IFQ system uh, became effective. All fish are pr primarily caught by uh, long line gear for the 2016 to 2020 period, about 97% of the landings came from that gear type and about 2% came from auto troll landings, which are incidental landings. And there are some minor amounts of tau fish landed incidentally in uh, gill nets and, and pots and, and trout. 2020, 1.3 million pounds of tau fish were landed, and this represented a 9% decrease from the prior year. Uh, Excess of revenues were at about $4.8 million, 11% uh, decrease from price per pound was $3.75, and this represented less than a 2% decrease. Hey, Jose, this is Mary. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but your audio is kind of um, coming in and out a little bit. Um, could you try to get a little bit closer to the mic? Okay, I will, I will do my best. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. This is uh, 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 from... Uh, Garfo from the weekly quarter uh, report. And this here, the blue line represents uh, incidental golden tail fish landings from the, for the current fishing year. And the yellow line represents landings for the prior uh, fishing year. So landings for this year are slightly ahead of the landings uh, for, that, for last year. And as of January 9, uh, this last point here about 21,000 pounds of tall fish has been landed incidentally, which uh, accounts for about 30% of the of the quarter. Now, according to the Northeast, Northeast Fisheries Science Center, uh, discard estimations for commercial uh, fisheries are low of, of golden tall fish. Mostly, they're discarded in large mesh, small mesh trolls and gill nets. And on average, for the 2016 uh, to 2020 period, uh, 17,400 pounds of uh, tall fish were uh, discarded per year. In 2020, there were 50 dealers that purchased $4.8 million uh, of tall fish from 105 uh, vessels. The dealers are mostly located in New York, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Here you see uh, VTR data, which indicates that the number of tall fish landed by party charter vessels is low, ranging from 80 fish in 1996 to about 8,300 fish in 2015. In 2020, about 3,500 fish were landed on party charter uh, trips, and this represents about 2,000 fish less than in 2019. And I will be talking a little bit more about this in, in a few minutes. And then we also have the last two columns there. We have private landings reported from the new uh, uh, permitting and reporting requirement system was, was recently implemented. And we see that fish, 50 fish were landed in 2020. However, these are just landings from August to uh, December of 2020, so we don't have a full year of, of landings here. So the private recreational angler permitting and reporting re 
requirements became mandatory in August 17 of 2020. And the permit allows anglers to land uh, both golden tilefish or, or blue line tilefish. And, and this, this system was implemented in order to get a better understanding of the landings levels by this component of the fishery. And there was a lot of outreach materials and webinars that were provided by Garfo and the council leading up to the final rule. And they will continue to be circulated as these regulations become uh, commonplace. So we're hoping that uh, we, we're going to be getting uh, uh, more and better information as time uh, progresses. And in addition, for the benefit of the group, Garfo will be uh, will be making a presentation to the council towards the end of the year to review how this initiative is working. So we're going to have a lot of. Uh, uh, good information that is going to be provided and it's going to give, give us a better understanding of how this uh, system has been uh, has worked uh, for for uh, for one one year time period. We met with advisors uh, back in February of this year and we asked a series of particular questions as we typically do and they identified several uh, critical issues that I'm going to be talking about now today, uh, but there is more information in the fishery performance uh, report that was produced by the advisors. I also want to know that the advisors have consistently indicated that they like to see the status quo quotas from year to year because this translates into fishery and market stability. In addition, they have indicated that they, they don't like to see big changes in, in, in the quotas from one specification uh, uh, cycle uh, uh, to another specification cycle uh, time period. So they like to see things uh, uh, constant, consistent and stability uh, across time. Regarding COVID-19, there was a reduction in demand, uh, and this was due to restaurant closures. Uh, the industry continues to spread landings uh, throughout the year to avoid market gluts. They saw a large price reduction at the beginning of the pandemic, but this is uh, now relatively stable that the prices are. And before higher effort was reduced in 2020, uh, advisors reported that a lot of uh, those trips that they have sold were, were, uh, were canceled. And they're experiencing the same in 2020. Industry continues to see an, an increasing catch per unit effort. More fish is caught with the same trip effort compared to 2019. There is a large amount or proportion of um, small and kittens uh, that were landed in 2020 compared to the uh, previous uh, two years. And these are small fish, two to 3.5 pounds. And that trend has continued. Uh, in 2021. In addition, in addition, the 2020 tuna season was uh, very good and there were less boats targeting tile fish and perhaps this has some type of impact on that lower number of fish that were landed in 2020 compared to 2019. They support the development of the next year specifications framework and, and, and the changes that And they also express concerns about the lack of biological sam sampling of landings on the dock. And this is some advisors also indicated that they would like to have more input when future long line surveys are designed. They some individuals indicated that they wanted the captain's input regarding where to fish and where to sample. Uh, this, is, this is not an overall statement of the group. I have heard from other industry members and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and advisors that they understand why the, the survey is designed the way it is and the importance of have a fishery uh, uh, independent uh, survey. This table here shows the, uh, the, how the catch and landings limits are calculated for this fishery. So everything that is above this dashed line, that's what the SSC does. And basically, develop an ABC 
uh, from an OFL taking into consideration scientific uncertainty. And then below this dash line is the monitoring committee, what the monitoring committee does. And basically, the monitoring committee looks at recent action landing trends and management uncertainty to derive an ACP. And then we take into consideration these cars to derive uh, a PAR. So now I'm going to go ahead and switch so we can have the uh, SSC report. Yeah, thanks for that, Jose. Um, thanks for your initial part of your presentation. Um, Dr. Paul Rego would be doing the SSC report. Is Paul here today? Paul, if you're speaking, we can't. Okay, hear yeah. You. Okay. There you uh, go. Okay. Good I morning. Uh, now. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. I apologize. I had to push an extra button there. Um, no worries. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Jose, for a comprehensive uh, summary. Um, what I'd like to do today is uh, review SSC comments. These are found on page four to seven in tab 14 of, the, of our report to the council. Um, golden tilefish, uh, the assessment did include data through 2020. This is unique uh, in terms of the management track assessments. One of the reasons for that is that it relies exclusively on fishery dependent data. Um, the, the model itself um, behaved well, performed well, and retrospective patterns are insignificant. As Jose indicated, the CPUE oscillates uh, uh, over time, and this is reflective of new recruits entering the fishery. This is also kind of a case study of an equilibrium fishery uh, that has uh, been a benefited by by setting quotas at the, at the appropriate level over time. Um, we expect the CPUE to to decline in the coming years, uh, not immediately, but um, this is due to the this this pulsing of of year classes through the through the population. Um, one notable aspect of the of the model is that it has a dome shaped uh, selectivity pattern. Um, which means that older fish are less vulnerable uh, to to capture. As Jose indicated, there are uh, reports of large proportions of two to three and a half pound fish in the landings, uh, which also is a good sign of potential incoming um, information. Another good sign is that the, the two recent long line surveys conducted with industry support um, will be evaluated at the 2024 research track assessment. These have been uh, significant uh, improvements, uh, or could be significant improvements in, in our understanding of the, of the, the resource. And then finally, um, one of the major changes in, in this uh, updated management track assessment was the inclusion of uh, more year-specific age length keys, that is, uh, the, the age information was available for the year in which they were captured as opposed to uh, linked over over several years. So next slide, please. Um, there is a, a concern which is, was expressed for uh, bluefish, uh, scup, black sea bass, and, uh, and, and uh, summer flounder yesterday is that recent declines in biological samples are, are our concern, and this isn't just an academic uh, concern. Um, one analysis that that Paul Nitschke did uh, showed that you know a relatively small sample of 16 unclassified fish had a had a big impact in terms of estimation of a cohort. Um, so you know we we noted that uh, uh, we don't want to have uh, you know, undue optimism or, as Alan Greenspan said, irrational exuberance over uh, that. But, you know, we can protect ourselves against these kinds of things by having a improved biological sampling. Uh, as noted, uh, golden tilefish are rare in the MRIP angler intercepts. Um, and uh, as of now, the, the, the effects of the mandatory reporting are, are not yet interpretable, so we'll wait uh, um, that. Um, and then noted within the SSC meeting itself, a um, member of industry expressed the desire for a stable harvest level, even if these occurred at slightly lower levels. Um, and, you know, 
noted that this not only it helps ensure proper development of markets, but also can avoid some of the oscillations that, that cause between years that cause price fluctuations. Uh, this is uh, also a not commonly expressed sentiment, uh, so um, is is probably indicative of, of the, the good partnership between research and management. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the SSC recommended an OFL of uh, CV of 100%. Uh, we noted that there's good consistency between the input data and the model dynamics, uh, nothing pathological in the retrospective patterns. Um, I noted earlier that projection sensitivity um, and uh, also the fact that uh, recruitment into this fishery um, takes a number of years. So um, the four to five year old fish are the ones that are first entering the, the, the catchable uh, part of the resource. So um, you don't really have um, a lot of uh, uh, early warning, so to speak, in terms of uh, changes in, in the resource. Um, as you would if you had a, uh, a more uh, either a fishery independent or or some some way of monitoring the smaller sized individuals. Um, I, I will get to bottom line estimates uh, from the SSC in my last slide, but um, I'll, I want to go back and just before that talk about sources of uncertainty. So that'll be the next slide, please. Um, sources of uncertainty, it's, uh, you know, again, it, it relies 100% on fishery dependent data at the present time, uh, notwithstanding the you know, future um, fishery independent, um, you know, cooperative uh, data that will be forthcoming. There were some concerns about, um, you know, the present use of the FMSY proxy uh, and that uh, is, will be addressed in the, <clears throat> in the uh, upcoming uh, stock assessment. Uh, the dome shape selectivity curve is is uh, is important because um, you're you, you're estimating uh, that the force of mortality on older fish is smaller than it is on on uh, middle aged and younger fish, so that it can be can create some uh, uh, perhaps too large an estimate and it sometimes in terms of overall stock size. So um, that is a source of uncertainty uh, in the uh, view of the SSC. Uh, there are a number of spatial concerns. Um, the extent uh, of uh, site fidelity of individuals to spawning areas and so forth. Uh, these are basically marine prairie dogs and, uh, you know, do uh, seem to have uh, some sort of um, social organizations that uh, uh, inter for interactions. Um, again, uh, uncertainty in the stock range and distribution uh, that is you know, addressed in part through the ex continued use of the long line survey. Um, and then um, it's it's probably too early to to evaluate any of the consequences of the the newly closed areas. Um, the Lack of recreational um, catch information is is a current concern. It may not be in the future if and if uh, if the MRIP uh, revisions in the mandatory reporting do uh, take effect. Um, and <clears throat> the uh, uh, SSE noted some use of uh, the, the pooled age length key in some of the early years of the model. Uh, have some important imp implications, um, and I mentioned the, the recruitment concerns as well. Next slide, please. So um, the SSC, you know, recognizing that there was an upcoming assessment in 2024, um, it recommended some uh, areas of improved data collection. These include uh, a continuation or use uh, of the uh, full use of the fishery independent cooperative survey, um, perhaps using more of the observer coverage to improve the fishery dependent data, you know, additional details on, on uh, behaviors and uh, fishing performance. Uh, there continues to be a need for checking the accuracy and the repeatability, reliability of aging techniques and um, this continuation of adequate age samples 
um, is is really important. And then there was some uh, you know ways uh, expressions that um, you know, using or leveraging uh, existing fishing activity to provide additional biological samples could be an important uh, piece of future uh, research. Um, and then I mentioned the, the sanctuary issue. Uh, in terms of modeling improvements, um, these are you know, further work on on just refining or estimating or validating uh, the uh, dome shape selectivity pattern. Um, just re-evaluating that that overfishing basis that is at forty percent as a, as a as a biological reference point, and then. Um, some issues related to improving the the, the uh, projection methodology. To and I noted earlier, some of the concerns that were raised with respect to those uh, 16 fish that had some consequence, those unclassified fish. Um, overall, you know, we we noted that um, uh, these this conservative approaches to the changes in total allowable uh, landings uh, have, have resulted in. Both overall benefits to the to the to the resource as a whole and to the fishery, um, and then um, again, um, just to reemphasize uh, the the concerns expressed about uh, biological port sampling. So next slide, please. Thank you. So so in terms of bottom line um, projections and, and recommendations, the SSC was avail able to um, fully you know, evaluate or, and uh, review two scenarios, the first being a P-STAR um, uh, scenario, which is uh, labeled as uh, scenario one in this graph. And then the second is an average <clears throat> recommendation based on the average uh, of the, of, of the uh, uh, ABCs in the, in the P-STAR evaluation. So um, in the uh, ABC recommendation under P-STAR, it goes from 867 to 917 to 890. Uh, the P-STARs uh, associated with that are, are 0.43 to 0.46. Um, we don't have that same issue that we uh, had uh, yesterday or two days ago with respect to uh, being at the council's overall risk level of 0.49. So, um, that leads to a situation in which um, the average, the 891 of those uh, P-STAR values can be implemented um, and uh, without uh, exceeding the overall risk tolerance uh, of, of a risk policy for the council. So um, it, uh, it basically says that this is acceptable under the uh, aspects of, of scientific risk. So um, thank you very much. And I'll turn the, the microphone back over to uh, Jose. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Jose. Yeah, thanks, Paul, um, for that uh, for that presentation. And I guess we're gonna go back to Jose, who's gonna set the stage for uh, actions that we need to take today. So go ahead, Jose, whenever you're ready. Thank you. So as it was just indicated, the SSC provided ABCs under two scenarios. And while they didn't uh, select a preferred uh, scenario, they noted the benefits and higher practice of a constant ABC. Uh, in addition, industry, uh, an industry representative noted that they had some concerns about the high ABCs because this will be sold in high EALs and the fishery might not be able to sustain those uh, values. So now I'm gonna to move to the staff recommendations. This is the memo to push more. Staff recommended to set a, a, a constant catch beyond these limits for 22, 23, and 24. Um, basically, it was the one under a scenario two, 1.964 million pounds uh, ABC, no adjustments for management uncertainty, slight adjustment to incidental discards and no changes to the back limit or incidental trip limit. So this was the initial step. This table here, uh, table four in the staff memo to Chris Moore shows what, what those were doing. And you basically got these values here, the TAL and the incidental catch fishery uh, TAL, 
you get about 1.95 million pounds. Monitoring committee met the day after the SSC met and we provided recommendations. Overall, the recommendations are near identical to staff recommendations. However, the ACP is slightly lower than the ABC ACL, ACP also recommended by staff. The difference is uh, about 108,000 uh, pounds uh, low. So the resulting PALs from the ACP recommendation of the monitoring committee the overall PAL will be 1.8 million pounds. And this is only a 5.5% decrease from the recommendation made by staff. Still, it is 13.2% higher than the PAL that is implemented, was implemented, was implemented for uh, 2021. So the monitoring community recommendation, we, we look at that we look at the performance of the fishery when we had the 1.995 million pound uh, quota that was implemented at the beginning of the, uh, when the FMP was first implemented, that's the quota that we had from 2001 to about 2030. That value, uh, we saw that the fishery did uh, perform well and the biomass started to increase. But then we had a couple of years where we had to take uh, drastic reductions in the cow, uh, and we drove that down to the 1.665 million pounds that is currently what we have. So the monitoring committee thinks that the 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 the, the kind of the and, and the industry that the sweet point for this fishery is a value that is somewhere in between those those two numbers. When you look at the the management track assessment. Uh, you see that the fishery has greatly improved under that 1.665 million pounds. So the value that is being proposed by the monitoring committee will provide uh, a stable long-term long uh, productivity uh, uh, number. Uh, in addition, the monitoring committee indicated that the, uh, uh, they were concerned about large increases in the cow because this could result in targeting of smaller fish and a higher risk to the stock. In addition, the monitoring committee shares the SSC concern about reduction in poor uh, biological uh, sampling. And we are recommending that the council writes a letter to the poor sampling program regarding the need to maintain and actually probably the need to increase port sampling. I know uh, Paul Regal indicated, <clears throat> excuse me, that this is an issue for many of our fisheries and for golden cow fish is, is also a critical issue because this is a data poor uh, species. And this component, this information is very important for Paul Nishki to conduct his, uh, the work that he does and make, and make the projections. So uh, if the council decides that this is something that we need to do, I don't even think that we need a, a motion. We can probably have discussion, but staff can, can write that letter if the council uh, give us the okay. So here's the summary of the overall uh, recommendations that were made by the monitoring committee. And basically, again, I wanna bring your attention to these last two uh, rows here. If you were to add the IFQ, uh, the IFQ fishery cow and the incident cow, you get about 1.83 million pounds. And that value just happens to be between the 1.995 million pounds and 1.665 million pounds that the council have been uh, uh, have implemented in the last uh, uh, 15, uh, 17 years or so. Lastly, I want to bring you back to the multi-year specifications uh, framework uh, to the issue of the fishing year. As I indicated before, you selected an alternative that is going to change the fishing year from January 1st to December 31st. So, and this is something that you don't have to worry about it right now. This is something that is in the framework, but I just want to bring this to your attention. attention. So we're going to have a one-time adjustment only to gap the fishing year. So 2022 fishing, fishing year will extend from November 1st, uh, 2021 to December 31st, 2022. 
And then the fishing years for 2023, 2024, and, and future years will be set from January 1st to December uh, 31st. As I indicated before, the resulting overall monetary committee is 30% higher compared to 2021. However, on a common monthly denominator basis, it's, it's about slightly lower, like about 3% about lower due to that gap. Divided by, by 12, we get 135,359 pounds. And when you take the monitoring committee, PAL, recommended PAL, PAL divided by 14, we get 131,349 uh, pounds. Hey, Jose. Yes. Um, this is Mike. Can you go back to that previous slide? You cut out for about 10 seconds. Um, can you go back through? No, not that one, the one that you were just on. Can you go back to bullet two and work through that again? Um, Cause you cut out for a few minutes on your, on your. Yeah, I, I, yes, sure. I apologize for that. I have a new microphone and I guess that I'm well, obviously. I'm... So the resulting overall uh, EAL that was recommended by the monitoring committee for 2022 is 13th higher compared to what we have uh, now for 2021. But what I was saying that on a monthly common denominator basis it is three percent lower, and that's just because I said that the next fishing year is going to be it's going to have to be extended to fourteen months, so we can we can have that we can gap that transition from the current fishing year, that is November one to October thirty uh, first to the new fishing year that is going to be January one through December thirty first. So the the the, uh, you can see that currently the overall PAL is 1.6 million pounds, and that comes to about 135,359 pounds per month. And the one, the PAL, the overall PAL that is being recommended by the monitoring committee is 1.8 million pounds. And when you divide that by 14, because that's how we're going to be extending the next fishing year, you get about 131 thousand pounds. So that represents uh, a, a, a small decrease on a month to month basis. And again, this is something that was uh, I, I, I already addressed in, in the framework document. It doesn't really, I mean, it shouldn't be impacting what you're doing today, but I just want to bring that to the attention of the council and, and industry. This is basically a, a, an overall look at what, what would have uh, as I indicated before, the first meeting was in April. We selected preferred process related, process related alternative. Uh, staff work on completing the draft EA. We're having the second meeting today. We're going to be selecting catch and landings limits for 2022, 23, and 24, and approve the document for submission. And then Council will. Uh, We'll make minor modifications to the document, finalize that document, and submit it to, to the service for uh, approval. And that concludes my presentation, Mr. Chair. Okay, thanks, Jose. Um, maybe you could go back to that last slide to give the council um, some direction on the advice that, that we need to give at this point. Um, I'm looking at notes that you had sent me uh, regarding the actions that we need to take here. Uh, there is a draft motion that I know you've prepared, um, but what I'd like to do first is look to members of the council for, for any uh, questions that they might have. Um, and we can probably do questions and comments at the same time prior to uh, draft motions. And I see Mike. The, the only, the only... I just want to make go ahead, Jose. Just want to make a quick, a quick comment. Yeah, we can use the. Uh, it's it's going to be basically the same uh, the same motions that I sent you before. The only difference is that I I substituted the the table that I originally sent you. The motion that I'm gonna I'm gonna be putting up. We're gonna have a table that looks like this, which is the monitoring committee uh, recommendation. 
which I think that is a more uh, uh, it's, it's a better recommendation than the the one that was initially made by by staff. Okay, so the table that I have in my notes is different from this table. Yes, and and, and the table that I'm going to put up when when we go into the motions is going to reflect that change. So this okay. this table here in the motion is exactly the table that was. Uh, reflects the recommendation of the monitoring committee. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jose. Um, I have a couple of hands that came up. Uh, let me start with Mike Pentney and then we'll go to Peter Hughes next. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't have a question uh, for Jose or, or really comments on the presentation, which I thought was very informative. Um, but I do note that the issue of the port sampling came up um, the other day and then it came up uh, a couple of times in Jose's presentation and Dr. Rego's presentation. So I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, it's, you know, so there's a partnership for the port sampling between the Science Center and the uh, regional office. Um, GARFO gets uh, funding every year from headquarters in our budget. Uh, we then manage a contract um, to run the port sampling program. Um, and the center uh, identifies the prioritization of species based on their assessment needs. For the last, you know, I don't know how many years, but at least a, a few years, the, the funding level we've received from headquarters uh, has remained flat each year, while the costs of the contract, as you can imagine, have increased along with cost of living um, increases and, and such. So. Uh, for any given year, the number of samples that we're able to uh, purchase, if you will, with the contract money has gone down. So that's uh, part of what you're seeing. And then the second phase of that is obviously the prioritization requests that we get from the Science Center for their assessment needs. Um, given that we're constrained on budget, the only way to increase uh, sampling of tilefish, for example, would be to decrease uh, sampling of some other species. And that you know triggers a whole host of other concerns. So I actually um, you know welcome the, the comments of the council uh, on this, um, but maybe suggest that this would be a good topic for the NRCC to discuss uh, so that we can get the commission and the um, co both councils together as you know as um, customers, if you will, of the support sampling data. Uh, and then we can have that discussion, um, you know, recognizing the flat budget and uh, the constraints on our sampling ability. Um, what species would the councils uh, like us to prioritize? And we can work through with the center uh, to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mike. Um, and that's, you know, definitely something I think we need to put. Um, yeah, you know, I, I I appreciate your uh, your thoughts about working that through with leadership at the NRCC. So hopefully that's something that we can do at one of our upcoming meetings um, throughout this year. So I appreciate that. Um, Peter Hughes, you're next, and then Dan Farnham, you'll be after Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, checking my microphone. Yeah, you sound fine. Go ahead. Okay, great, thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, I I've been thumbing through the the 77 page uh, document and um, I, I see that the number of dealers are listed, but I haven't yet come across uh, how many permit holders there are. And there's a couple of different categories for permit holders. I believe there's a, a ITQ uh, permit holder and then there's incidental, I believe. And then is there a recreational? I was wondering if there's if how many ITQ permit holders are in the universe of um, tile fish, and is it the same permit for blue line tile as it is for golden tile? And then I have a follow up. I think there there is a tile fish permit that allows you to land tile fish commercially. There is no. And, and if you want to fish under the IFQ rules, then you need to have an IFQ allocation. So there, we, don't, we don't have an IFQ permit per se. It's the same permit for everyone. However, if you want to land tile fish above that uh, uh, incidental trip limit, uh, and you want to land as, as a, 
a, a, the directed fishery, then you need to have your IPQ allocation. So <clears throat> there are about, we have about probably 12, 11, 11, 10, 11 vessels or so participating in the directed uh, fishery, the IFQ uh, fishery. And then we have uh, a few thousand permits out there that are for uh, tilefish that allows you to fish for, for tilefish. Uh, but the incidental, and, and then as I show you, uh, like about 105 boats have landed tilefish. So the bulk of those boats are incidental boats that are landing very small amounts of tilefish. And the vast majority of the landings come from those uh, 10, 11 bo boats that are fishing under the uh, IFQ uh, permit. Uh, regarding the recreational permits, I, I think that it's, and I think that Mike Anthony might, might be talking about this uh, when he makes his report, but I think that we have like about 640 permits around that number that have been issued to recreational uh, anglers. So they can fish for both blue line tilefish and golden tilefish under the uh, uh, you know, as as a as a as a recreational uh, private angling. Thanks, Jose. I appreciate that, um, and thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I I I just I guess I wanted to just point out that the universe of the IFQ fishery, who make up the majority of the landings, um, it looks like is is a pretty small universe. Um, that being said, I, I, I think I'd like to uh, support uh, what Mr. Petney said that having a conversation uh, at the NRCC in regards to port side sampling, uh, I think would I think would benefit this fishery. Um, so thank you very much, uh, and I will sign off and hand it over back to you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Okay, um, the next hand that I have is uh, Dan Farnham. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, yep, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. You know, um, uh, as a follow-up to what Peter just said, it is indeed a very small universe, this fishery. And um, yeah, through to the fact that I, I am owner of a vessel that lands more than 10% of the total harvest of the golden tilefish fishery, I'm going to have to recuse myself from any uh, from voting on any final action motions that we uh, come up with today, but I believe I'm still able to uh, to voice my comments, make motions, and deliberate. I just want to clear that with John Almedia before I go forward, please. Yeah, you know, Dan. So you are able to make motions and be part of any discussion, um, but your recusal uh, from voting it just it keeps you know you're going to have to you'll recuse yourself from voting, but um all the other parts of the discussion and the motion making um you're you're definitely welcome to be part of I'll, I'll just confirm that with john but i you know over the years we don't we don't we haven't had too many recusals over the years uh here in the mid but let me just check with john to make sure that i'm not giving you the wrong advice that's right uh as, as far as final action with a recusal you know the final i guess you know, selection of alternative um, would be something you would recuse yourself from, but the deliberations and preliminary motions leading up to that point of selection would be something would be you, you'd be able to participate. And even as to something that a vote that you recuse yourself from, you are able to participate in the discussions of such a vote. Right. Okay. So, so at that point, when it comes to the final vote, do I abstain or do I not vote at all? No, you would you would be a you would be a recusal. So, in the record, we'll have the vote with um, support, opposition, abstentions, and with one recusal. Um, if you're the only one that needs to recuse themselves on that on that vote, so it'll just be part of the record that way. But you would you would you would not vote based on your comment. Um, we would just indicate that in the record as a recusal. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, you're welcome. 
on that, while I have the mic, can I go forward? I actually, I actually have two questions, and then yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. go ahead, Dan. Sure, um, Jose. At one point, you you had a slide up for for discards, and it it went through a little bit quick for me to see. Do you do you have a gear type where the discards came from? Looks like Jose is trying to get back to that slide. Let's give him a second here. Um, yep, okay. Jose, you, there you go, Jose. I, I can hear you now. I, I didn't know if you were trying to talk and you, maybe you were on mute, but I can hear you now. Unless that was Dan, I couldn't tell who it was. Yeah, that that was me talking. Yeah, that that's okay. fine though. That 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 clarifies it. I, I didn't. I just wanted to make sure that that, that there was no um, no discards associated with the directed longline fishery. I, I'm pretty sure they're they're pretty much zero. Uh, one other thing. One other question, Jose. Before you make a comment, uh, the number of MRAP intercepts. Is there any more information on that? I know last year we looked at it. And it was it was very you know a lower amount of intercepts. But do you have any information on the number of intercepts, pounds landed, number of fish landed, anything to that effect? Yes, the, 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 there are a couple of tables that were presented in some of the uh, some of the background uh, documents. I don't have it in front of me, but MREP indicated that no tile fish were landed by party charter or recreational, uh, private recreational anglers in 2020. I, I have no idea, uh, so, so zero fish were reported landed, but, but as, as uh, you know, Paul Rego indicated, you know, Embrit just, just it, 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 golden tail fish, blue line tail fish, the, the rare event species. So that, that is specific uh, uh, data uh, type of data doesn't really uh, reflect the reality of of uh, of, uh, of the fishery. So, but for 2020, there were no landings, zero. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, you know, my my overall thought on the uh, on the on the quota for this fishery. I've been involved with this fishery from, geez, when I was 18, 19, the late 70s. I've seen the ups and downs. I, I've seen. I, I seen the, the the really good years back in the beginning. Uh, we worked full time right through the time series where the quota was steady for however many years that was. The two million, you know, one point nine million pound quota. I I um I, I've come to realize with the, with this fishery especially being cautious with with management and the quota levels is is really important. Um, it, it seems to me we can get fooled into into. Uh, fool ourselves into seeing the good years and enjoying them and 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 being tempted to take a little bit more and then all of a sudden you realize well geez we took we took a little bit too much and then then we're back to 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 relying on one year class coming through and luckily right now we have two i think from what paul rego said there was a 2013 and 14 where the two year classes were the bigger ones and then we think we have another one right now but but I would recommend personally that we that we go with the monitor committee's uh, recommendation, which is middle of the road between status quo and the staff recommendation. And I do appreciate the staff recommendation. Believe me, a lot of work went into it. I just for me personally, I think I would like to go with the uh, monitor committee's recommendation. And um, after whenever you think, Mr. Chairman, after through the comment period, if you want to circle back, I'll make a motion to that effect. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, I just want to, and 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 your comments um, are not different from comments we've heard over the over the years that I've been part of the council uh, about kind of trimming back a little bit and maybe not taking it as far as what um, the stock assessment or some of the recommendations might suggest. So um, you're you're in line with what has happened in the past. Um, I'm looking at the draft motion. 
So, so basically, basically what I have here is a yeah. table that shows the monitoring committee uh, recommendation, which I, I agree with Dan. I think that is is is, is probably something that the uh, council should sh uh, carefully consider. Okay, so um, I would like to get to a motion, and then we, we can take some more com uh, take some more questions, more comments, and then I'll definitely go to the public uh, for public in um, public input on this. But so I'm looking at this. How would your draft motion? Um, is is that draft motion? Yes, uh, sir. I, I is this it, space, is, is, this. I'm just there's a lot of numbers there, and I. Honestly, it's a little hard to see. I have my glasses on and I'm like, I got my eyes right up against the screen. Um, so, so basically, Mr. Chair, if, if I may, this is basically, yeah, yeah, please. This is basically the way we have done it for this fishery in, in the last few iterations. And it's basically okay. say, hey, we moved to establish the tall fish specifications, catch and landings limits in accordance to the numbers that are presented in, uh, in this table. Okay. We've done this before. A few times, and it has worked. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, and I, and I, you know, going back to what Dan's comments were. Yeah, this is something that we've done before, um, but I want to make sure that it reflects. Uh, if Dan wants to make this motion, I want to make sure the numbers in this table reflect what it was that he uh, had suggested. So, Dan, can you help me out with that and make sure that the numbers here reflect what you were uh, suggesting? You know, I'm a little confused, Jose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. By the way, I'm a little confused. Is this not the staff recommendation? The oh, you know, this is the monitoring you. committee. This is the monitoring committee recommendation. This is table one of the monitoring committee report. So, uh, let me let me just bring the monitoring committee report. Let me see. I, I thought the uh, staff recommendation was 891 metric tons, 1.964 million pounds and that the monitoring committee recommendation was I don't have the metric tons. I might have been I forget, but it's uh, 1.838 million pounds. 1.856. No, this this is yeah let, let me bring the document up okay? there. Yeah, let's get this let's get this cleared up. Dan, so you're you would like to go with the monitoring committee recommendation. That's what I heard from you earlier. So we just want to make sure that if we have a motion, um, it's reflecting what it is. You know, there are a lot of numbers here, and there, you know, there's very well. There's some difference between the different values, but I just want to make sure that we get this right. So, so here we have table one of the monitoring committee report, and this is a okay. summary of the monitoring committee recommended catch and landing limits. This is identical. To what I have under that specific uh, specific motion. So then, okay. when you look at the numbers here, the overall the resulting PAL for the IOQ fishery is one point seven six three million pounds, and for the incidental fishery is seventy five thousand five hundred four hundred and ten pounds. If if I move down here, this was the staff recommended. So you see that this number here is a little bit higher, 1.866, the overall PAL, and the incidental fishery PAL is, is 80,000 pounds. So both of these numbers, the resulting PAL from the, from the staff recommendation was slightly higher than what the monitoring committee recommended. But what I have on that motion and, and is, is, is this table. And I also added here, Table one of the monitoring committee report. I think that that will avoid any further confusion. Yep. Okay. Very good, Jose. Thank you very much for clarifying that. I also have my glasses on and I can barely read those numbers. <laughs> I know <laughs> it's really hard. I and I have all these papers around me. I'm. I'm I, I feel like I'm. Uh, I, I've. I've got pieces of paper everywhere with notes on everything. Um, but I think Jose did a nice job of describing. The monitoring committee versus the staff recommendation. So, Dan, uh, in order to keep this discussion going, if you would like to make a motion um, regarding the monitoring committee recommendation, I would turn to you now for that. 
And if you could read that motion into the record, you don't need to read all the numbers in the table. You just have to refer to that table as as uh, indicated in the motion. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can see it now too, Jose, with my one pair of glasses. Um, I'd like to make that motion. I'd like to move to establish the golden tile for specifications, catch and landings limits for 2022, 2023, and 2024 as specified in the table below, table one of the MC report. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dan, for that motion. Let me see if there are any hands. Uh, for a second to that motion, I see Peter Hughes. Peter, did you want to second that motion? I do. Thank you, Dan, and thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and Dan, um, you already, you, you know, you justified uh, the reasoning behind your motion already. Did you have anything else you wanted to offer at this time? No, I, I think uh, the rationale remains the same, just to, to be a little more precautionary, middle of the road. Um, even the, the SSC outlined some some concerns uh, uh, with uncertainty, and uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, Peter, did you have anything you wanted to offer as seconder of the motion? I, I would just like to point out um, the my the, the reason for my earlier question. The universe of the of the IFQ ITQ permits is relatively small, and although the staff recommendation is a little higher than the monitoring. Um, committee's recommendation. Um, I, I, I think that the that you know Dan has to recuse himself from the final vote. That Dan is a boots on the ground um, tile fish fisherman um, in harvesting over ten percent of the fishery, and I understand the 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 need and the reason coming from a boots on the ground person for maybe a little bit of additional conservation. So, thank you, Dan, for that motion, and thank you, Mr. Chair. No, understood. I appreciate that, Peter. Uh, let me see if I have any other hands. Does anyone have any comment that they would or any discussion they would like to have regarding the motion before I go out to the public? Okay, seeing no other hands at this time, let me go out to the public uh, to see if there's anybody who would like to comment regarding the motion um, that's before us. Uh, Ms. Nolan, nice, nice to see you're, uh, you know, back at the, uh, back at the table here with us. Go ahead, Laurie. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I, um, I, I guess I'll say I support the motion. I, um, I'm a member of the monitoring committee and um i did throw up a couple other tal options perhaps you know if you take the 905 where we were for 14 years and you take the 742 where we are now um and certainly all good indicators coming out of stock updates um 823 is actually the average of those two quotas and um, I, like Dan, want to move forward cautiously and um, the idea that we would consider 891 being so close to 905 when 905 got us into trouble um, scared the heck out of me. So um, I'm happier to see a lower quota. I personally wouldn't mind if it was actually 823. Even I threw out status quo. Why fix it if it's not broken? We've got all good indicators right now. Let's see how far it carries us. But um, I will support this motion and appreciate the constant harvest strategy um, showing up in this alternative. And um, you know, don't like the idea of whiplash management. So we're looking for the sweet spot here and industry is begging us for constant harvest strategy. So. I um I'll, I support this and just hope that in 2024, when we have our benchmark assessment, we haven't gotten ourselves into the weeds with this number. But you know, I think everyone feels confident the number is somewhere in between, and we're just trying to find that number um, to stabilize and keep everything steady in this fishery. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. No, I appreciate that, Laurie. Um... I miss hearing your voice, so it's nice to hear your voice again. Um, 
I'm so excited. Can I just throw one more thing in? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I forgot. Yeah, no, okay. go, go ahead. Go, I go just want to say, like, we have the recreational permit now, right? It's a requirement. So there were some landings. I don't know that we touched on this. Jose did a terrific job. There was so much information. But there are some landings showing up in that permit requirement that the recreational sector is fishing under now. So I'll just say, hopefully down the road, we start to see you know, more reporting there so that we can move forward with confidence that we do have some representation of the recreational landings, because we all know we're not gonna capture that through MRIP. So hopefully that will continue to, to grow and, and be something that we have some confidence in and we actually have a representation of the recreational efforts out there and and that would be a good thing and of course completely support the idea of addressing the shoreside sampling shortage that we're experiencing now because of funding and everyone's touched on this but certainly hope we can see something come out of nrcc in order to support that program and certainly not let it go down any further than we're at right now and hopefully get back to where we were with that thank you Okay, thanks, Lori. Um, let me ask Jose or or maybe Mike. Is there any? Or do you have any comments regarding Lori's comment on uh, her last comment? Anything to reply to regarding the port sampling? Yeah. Well, I think that I think that. Uh, well, I don't know. This is up to leadership, but but I think that the recommendation that. Uh, that came out of Garfield uh, makes perfect sense to me. This is something that perhaps needs to be addressed at a, at a higher level uh, because of this has implications for other species as, as well. Uh, so I think that that's a, a good way to proceed. However, if the council wants us to still go ahead and write a letter uh, indicating our concerns, we can still do that. So it is, it's up to council leadership, I think. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Um... And I think, you know, based on the comments that were made before, uh, the NRCC is definitely a place to have that conversation. And uh, Laurie, I do appreciate your comments on that. I'm going to go next to Greg DiDomenico. Go ahead, Greg. Mr. Chairman, could you uh, come back to me? I have a question not related to the motion. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let, I'll, be, I'll try not to forget about you this time. Um, that was a, a, a subject of yesterday's discussions. I kept forgetting to come back to you. So, uh, maybe why don't you just leave your hand up for me? That would, that would be helpful, uh, as we work through this and then, um, we're just, you know, I'll, I think we're going to take a vote here shortly and then I'll come back to you, Greg. So, uh, are there any other comments from the public on the motion? Made by uh, Dan Farnham, seconded by Peter Hughes. Okay, seeing none. Um, let's try to do it this way. Are there any objections to the motion? Oh, I'm sorry, Eric. Go ahead, Eric. I just saw your hand come up. Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I, mean, I fully support this motion. I think it's smart. It's good business. This is one fishery that is very sensitive to supply instability. Um, the constant harvest stratish is paramount to maintain market presence and, and the stability in price. I just had a question about uh, the discards in the incidental fishery. Um, how many trips in that category landed the 500 pounds, which I think it's 500 pounds whole weight, not dress weight. Um, that's my my first question, and I would like to point out that I think that the, when it comes to the value of the fishery, it might be overstated slightly because some of those uh, pricing data is based on FOB market, not X vessel. You know, the, the, the vessels are landing in, for example, Montauk, and they're paying to ship into the market, but the price is, is reported as um, from the market, so it's actually higher than the actual ex vessel price, and, and that affects fees that the fishery has to pay. And I think those should be taken into account. 
in the future. But my question is about discards in the incidental fishery. Uh, so maybe you can help me out there. So, so I, I, I think that I heard you asking two questions, and, and I could be uh, mistaken. But one of the questions was, how many trips are landing the the the, the incidental, the top, you know, the five hundred pounds uh, in the incidental fishery? Was that one of your questions? Yes, that's one of my questions. Yes, yes. So, so I have not, I, I haven't run that number uh, lately. We did a, an exercise a few years ago when we slightly changed the <clears throat> regulations because before it was 500 pounds uh, trip limit and that was the end of it. So if you, you could land up to 500 pounds if you were uh, if you didn't have an IFQ uh, permit, and there were a few a few trips that were that were on that 500 pound level. But this is several years back. But one thing that we did is we implemented a framework where we changed the, the language for the incidental trip limit slightly. And basically, now the incidental trip limit is 500 pounds or 50% by weight of all fish, including the golden, including golden cow fish. So we did that because uh, the council was concerned that perhaps there were a few boats that were targeting golden cow fish under the in incidental uh, 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 limit. But this specific uh, change uh, probably curtailed that quite a bit. So if I were to guess, and again, this, this is just, uh, I, I haven't seen the data, but I will say that the number of trips right now that are reaching that 500 pound limit are slightly less than what they used to be before that, that, was, uh, that, that, that measure was uh, implemented. And the other question was regarding discards, right? I, I, I'm sorry, could you repeat the other question? I, I forgot. Well, I guess my other question should be, what was the, what was the uh, reason for discards? And, and the reason I'm asking this, and the, the incidental category has their own piece of the pie, their own quota, so this does not affect the directed fishery, but I, I just, I hate to see, you know, I'd like to turn, discards into landings and it's not a lot of fish, it wouldn't affect the market, but I just, I'm just trying to understand exactly why those fish go back over. Yeah, I, I don't have this specific, I haven't looked at the specific uh, uh, reasons for uh, discards. I have heard from advisors and people at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center indicating that a lot of those small fish that are not recruited, that, that are not being caught by the directed fishery because they're still too small, sometimes are caught by trolls incidentally. And I think that those are the fish that you're probably seeing a lot of those uh, discards coming from. So we're okay, thank you. A very small fish. Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Eric, and thanks, Jose, for that back and forth uh, to clarify and, and um, make sure Eric had the information he needed. So I don't see any other hands. Greg, I do see your hand. I'm going to come back to you after we take a vote um, on this motion. So are there any, is there any other members of the council that want to add any comments before we vote on this? Peter Hughes, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I have a question, uh, but I it not pertaining to this motion. So I'm going to raise my hand after we uh, dispense with this motion. Okay, yeah, that's fine. So yeah, I'll come back to you and Greg um, once we dispense with the motion. So we have a motion. I'm going to read it into the record, and then I'll ask for support and opposition. Uh, the motion is move to establish the golden tilefish specifications parentheses catch and landings limits for 2022, 2023, and 2024 as specified in the table below parentheses table one of the monitoring committee report close parentheses. Uh, the motion made by Dan Farnham, seconded by Peter Hughes. Uh, let me see if we can do this. Um, by consensus, is there any objection to the motion? Okay, seeing no hands, 
Uh, the motion passes with no objection. Let me ask for abstentions to the motion. Seeing no abstentions, uh, the motion passes with no objections, no abstentions, and one recusal uh, by Dan Farnham, who put that on the record uh, earlier this morning. So um, thank you all for uh, working through that uh, discussion. Let's go back to, let me go to uh, Peter Hughes first, and then Greg, I'll come to you next. Go ahead, Peter, with your question. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, something that Mr. Reed touched on was market price versus X vessel price, and um, I, that that would be considerably different. And um, I'm just wondering what what you know what what are we what are we actually utilizing in uh, establishing um, the prices that are reflective in the uh, in the uh, um, the presentation, um, because there is a, there is a, there is a fee that IFQ or ITQ permit holders need to pay, and I believe that's, um, I, I don't know if that's on pounds or if that's on dollars and cents. So I was wondering how that price is reflected in the presentation, and then I have a follow up to that. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, let me see if Jose has anything he would like to offer. I don't have an answer for you. Um, Jose, so, are you comfortable with that question? Yeah, so the, yeah, I, I, I was, uh, the X vessel value is just the value that has been, uh, reported in the, in the bill of day. So it's just the, how much fish was, was how many pounds of fish were purchased and what the value of those fish were. And and the and the and the price per pound is just uh, dividing the value by the, the the pounds landed. So thanks for that. Now, is the dealer considered the first person that touches the fish, or is the dealer considered somebody in the marketplace where the fish is transshipped across somebody's dock? And it goes into you know Fulton Fish Market to a dealer there who then represents the price. We we the the dealer whoever is reporting through the, <coughs> the price that, that we're using. So yeah, this comes from dealer data. So uh, that that is that is just you know we, we look at a specific trips. We look at a specific uh, uh, information that comes from each one of those trips, and that has a dealer uh, number there and tells you how many pounds they bought and how many what what the value of those pounds were so th that's what we're using now where those dealers are if that dealer is in montauk or that dealer is located in a, a different place in long island i i don't I, I you know i don't know that i mean i will have to look at dealer specific information to know that but what, whatever the dealer is reporting that's what we're using Great, I appreciate that, Jose. Um, you know, maybe I can have some offline conversations with some people um, to further help me to understand how that price is established. Um, but I appreciate those answers. Uh, my next question is, and I don't know if this is to you, Jose, or to the group as a whole, or to NIMFS. Um, the mandatory recreational reporting. I saw that you were able to capture a couple of months of. Um, of of those re, of that reporting in your presentation, um, are 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 we satisfied with how the rollout of the mandatory reporting and the um, and, and the and the and the data that we're receiving because of that uh, mandatory reporting, or do we need to do uh, a little better job of getting that getting that word back out? And I don't know who that question is directed to. I, I, I could try to tackle that and perhaps Garfield might have a, a, a different a additional take, but uh, I, I think that Garfield and the council did, did, did a good job. As I indicated, there were several uh, webinars and a lot of outreach that, that happened for 
prior to those rules uh, being implemented. Uh, I have talked to uh, Douglas Potts from Garfo. I have talked to Matt Silly here from the office, and they continue to indicate that outreach efforts are going to continue in the in the future. Uh, I really don't have any specifics, but they're trying to uh, you know look at different ways to how these individuals can be approached, so they know that they have to be reporting their their landings accurately and, and timely and, and and so on. So. <clears throat> At the end, there were probably, uh, uh, you know, we, we would like to have uh, more more information on how this is working, but it was just implemented very recently. So, and that's one of the reasons we are going to have that presentation to the council uh, late this year. So, by then, we'll have a whole year of full implementation of this program. So, we'll have a better idea of how this program is working and how it can be improved at the same time. So at that time, I will say that we're probably going to get information on the total number of, of permits, uh, probably get information on permits by state. Uh, that was uh, uh, Dewey uh, indicated during one of the meetings that he would like to see that. So I think that Garfield is going to try to break that down. We're going to have information, hopefully, on landings and discards, and hopefully we'll have a reason of why those discards were uh, made. And one more thing that I want to uh, bring to your attention is in talking to the data people up at Garfo, uh, at one point I also indicated, uh, you know, we need to know how well this program is working from the perspective of how valuable the data that we're collecting is. So I don't know if we, you know, some statistical analysis is going to have to be conducted on some type of uh, analysis to see how that data, how robust that data is. And then if, if the answer is, yeah, this data is robust, then we can use that for management uh, purposes. But I think this is going to take time. I mean, it, it, it's a brand new program, so it's probably going to take time years, I will say, a few years for us to really be able to, to see numbers that, that uh, potentially make a, a, meaningful, a, a meaningful change in the way we understand uh, this component of the fishery. Thanks. Recognizing that it is a new program, I, I was just uh, curious as to see if people um, were satisfied and in a, in a few months of reporting that they have seen. So that's all. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Peter, and thanks, Jose, for that. Um, Greg, let me ask you, would you like to make a comment or question before we, before we move on this last, um, Item, or do you want to wait till the end? I can wait, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Okay. So uh, we do have one other motion that needs to be made, um, and it's up on the screen right now. Um, basically, submitting the framework to the National Marine Fisheries Service. Is there anyone who would like to make that motion? On behalf of the council. Uh, Peter Hughes, go ahead. Yep, I'll make that motion, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move that staff include the catch and landing limits presented above in the Tilefish multi year specifications framework document and submit the framework to the National Marine Fishery Service. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that motion, Peter. Do I have a second? Dan Farnham seconding that motion. Thank you, Dan. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? John Almeida, go ahead, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just a little confused. Maybe I missed something, but, um, has the council voted to adopt alternatives in the framework action? It seems like I might've missed a vote, but it seems like there ought to be a vote to adopt the alternatives before the submission vote. Yeah, I think the I think the one alternative that was needed was the previous motion. Let me right. let me clarify with staff to make sure because we, there there were already preferred alternatives uh, selected, 
And uh, let me go back to Jose to make sure that we're doing things right here. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry I interrupted, but I was just going to say what, what you just said. I, I mean, the council selected prefer alternative for two of the process related alternative. And then the last one is the catch and landing limits that you just selected prefer alternative. And now I just have to fold that into the document and then uh, the document will be ready to go. But yeah, you already selected alternative for the other prefer alternative for the other issue. Is that okay, John? I want to make sure you're the you're the one person I don't want to cross get crosswise <laughs> with. No, I I just wanted to make it clear that we had that vote already, and I I I think I might have missed it, but yeah, I, yeah, it was in the it was in the it was in the meeting materials. I read it this morning really early. Um, it was dark in the house, and and it was before the sun before the sun came up. But I did see that, so I know that we only had the one uh, the one motion to make to clear up. Uh, the landing uh, limits for the next couple years. So if you're good with it, then we can go ahead and move on this. All right, hearing nothing. Uh, let me ask, is there any objection to the motion? Are there any abstentions to the motion? I see Mike Pentney with his hand up. So, what I'll say is that the motion passes uh, with no objections and one abstention and one recusal from Mr. Farnham. Thanks to everybody for the, uh, the discussion. Let me go to Greg DiDomenico now. I think we're we're as far as what we need to do, Jose, uh, from the staff perspective, are we good to go from here? Yes, we're all, I'm all done. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so let me go to Greg DiDomenico, who had a question not related to the motions, and then we'll break for lunch. Uh, I got a note from Chris that it would be best if we, since we're a little early, uh, but we'll still break for, we'll, we'll, we'll start up at one o'clock. Um, but go ahead, Greg. We've got plenty of time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jose, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent. Okay. Good morning. Uh, I was wondering, Jose, um, for the vessels who hold a incidental permit, are all of them subject to the new mandatory EVTRs? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, and I will have to check on that, right? I, I don't know. Perhaps a, a, a different person that is a, a different staff member would know the answer to that, but, but I don't. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I can jump right. in on one if you're yeah, I, all right. Mike, I just, yeah, Mike, I just saw your hand come up. So yeah, if you can if you can jump in on that to help Greg out, that'd be great. Thanks. Yep. The answer to Greg's question is yes, they are subject to the EVTR requirement beginning in November. Um, Mr. Chair, can I please ask Mr. Petley just a quick follow-up question? Of course. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, uh, good morning, Mr. Petney. Um, are you, uh, is the agency still contemplating whether or not they will ask for do not fish reports? Or did, did not fish reports? So, yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, I wouldn't say that we uh, are are contemplating it. It's come up a number of times, and I've suggested that that should be something that the councils discuss, um, because when we eliminated the did not fish report, it was in part, um, you know, through a through a process of requests from industry and, and council collaboration to remove that requirement. Um, I would be uncomfortable unilaterally deciding to add it back on, even though you have you and some others have raised some um, some valid points. Uh, so I would encourage the councils of Mid Atlantic and New England Council um, to consider discussing this and developing a recommendation for us on it. Thank you, Mike. And one last question, please. Um, um, I think the uh, HMS is currently contemplating a rule uh, to make it mandatory for people who select and use uh, their permits 
uh, to have mandatory documentation numbers uh, displayed on their vessel. Is that also um, a requirement in the tilefish incidental permit? Um, I'll be honest, Greg, I am not sure what you mean by documentation number. Uh, I can check with staff to see if they know. Um, but that might be something that we have to research and get back to you on. Probably consult with HMS to make sure we're, we're you know, talking about the same things. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Greg. And, you know, um, I don't know if we can if we can pull that information together between now, Mike, and your uh, your report out during the business session tomorrow. But um, if not, Greg, we'll try to follow up with you uh, as soon as possible on that question. Um, is there anybody else from the public before I come back uh, to other business to the council? I don't see any hands from the public. Uh, Dan Farnham, you do have your hand up. Go ahead, Dan. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I'm going to follow up with Amadeus, so and I'm a little confused too. It's probably me. Don't worry. But I, I was under the impression there'd be three more alternatives to make motions on or vote on, either all together or individually. Or was the, was the one motion, did that incorporate the preferred alternatives for uh, fishing year timing? Uh, using average quotas or, or the number of years and if the, for the specs to be set at. So, based on, so I'm gonna, I'll go back to staff on this again. But um, at our first framework meeting, this is framework meeting two. Um, at our first meeting, we selected preferred alternatives for the other uh, items that were part of this framework, and so. The last item that we needed to deal with um, was the specifications piece. So those preferred alternatives have already been determined and they'll go forward as is, as, as decided at a previous meeting. Jose, you have to remind me when that meeting was and whether or not that's the correct, um, I can't, I can't think of the right word. I, 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 think that, I think that is the right process. I mean, we have done this before. We just did it for the last framework that we did for, uh, for Talfish. So basically, at the beginning of the year, I think that it was in April, April 17 or so, you select a preferred alternative for the two process-related issues. So the council already said that they would like to change the fishing year to, from January 1st to December 31st. So that's a done deal. You already did that. And then the council also selected an alternative that indicates that you would like to change the timing of the specs uh, uh, process, the time, the, the period to, to to mimic the NRCC stock uh, assessment schedule. So that, that's a done deal. You already approved those two preferred alternatives. So those changes, in fact. They're in the document right now as preferred alternatives that were selected by, by the council. So the only thing right. that if, if you wanted to change one of those alternatives, if you change your mind and you want to keep the fishing gear the way it is and you don't want the change, then you will have to incorporate that into this motion. Otherwise, I think that we're, we're good to go. Yeah, and it, you know, I appreciate that, Jose, but yeah, and I think Dan, Based on the decisions that were made prior and based on the motion that's already passed uh, to submit the framework to uh, the service. It would be awfully complicated. Uh, I'd need, I would need some advice as to how to go back and change those other alternatives. So um, I'll ask again, Dan, if if you're comfortable with Jose's response. No, I'm fine with it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure. I was, um, they were in the document and I just was just making sure. I'm sure Lori okay. knows the answer to that because she's very involved with this fishery and I'll be, I'll be here. Thank you. So, yeah, great. Okay. I, I, I just want to make a quick comment. So, so right now the document, again, it, it has those two, of the two process related alternative. We already identified what the preferred alternatives are. So those are already in the document. The only thing that I'm going to be doing now is going to have to make a lot of small changes to reflect 
this catch and landings limits that were selected by the council, the ones that were uh, uh, that come out of the monitoring committee uh, recommendation, because this was not, not in the document. So I'm going to have to do quite a bit of changing numbers around and, and, and writing text and so on, but that's not a big deal. But this is the only new thing that I'm going to put into the document. You already have the other two alternatives already are, are, are already identified as preferred alternatives. So again, I think that we're good to go. Okay, thanks, Jose. Yeah, it sounds like we're 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 clear on that. Um, let me. I've got two hands up. Let me go to Mike Pentney first. Laurie, I'll come back to you after Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just to close the loop on this one issue about what we voted on at the previous meeting versus what we're voting on today. I don't disagree with Jose. I think everything is all set and we've obviously already um, moved to approve the framework for submission, but maybe just to clarify for everybody sitting around the table. So it's, it's, it's clear in everybody's mind. Um, what we voted on today um, is that because we had already voted to change the start of the fishing year from November 1st to January 1st, uh, 2020, the 2022 fishing year will be a 14 month fishing year. It will begin November 1st, 2021, and it will run through December 31st, 2022, according to uh, the motions that the council has already adopted. Um, inherent in, I think, or implicit, but not explicit in what we did today is that the 2022 quota um, would be a, a, essentially a 12 month quota, but allocated to a 14 month year. Um, you know, another approach that the council could have taken would have been to scale up the 2022 quota so that it would be, you know, 14 twelfths or whatever, what have you, of of what was agreed to. Um, but my understanding based on, on the discussions with the monitoring committee um, and uh, this morning is that it would, we would not do that. We would simply take what would have been a 12 month quota and stretch it out over 14 months. So unless anybody is has an issue with that or a concern, um, I think that's how I interpret the, uh, the motions passed at the last meeting and at today's meeting. Okay, thanks, Mike, uh, for that clarification. Um, let me go back. To, I'll go back to Laurie. Go ahead, Laurie Nolan. Thank you, Mike Luisi. Um, I am just wondering. I everything Mike Pentney said is my understanding also, and and there's been a lot of discussion and clarification about what this framework amounts to. So I think everybody's putting the two framework meetings together and saying that's our package. But I'm just curious, because this is our specification package, um, does there need to be mentioned that there are no changes to the incidental trip limit or to the bag limit um, on the recreational sector? Because we're not citing, is it by default, no changes equals you don't have to talk about it, or do we just have to state somewhere that there are no changes to the incidental trip limit or the bag limit for the recreational sector for, the this, next, for these years. Okay, so the package yeah, no, I appreciate that, uh, Laurie. I believe it's by default, but let me ask Jose. It, it is. It is by default. You're right. Okay. Okay. Thank so you. it doesn't. It, it doesn't need to be mentioned. Okay. So it sounds like we're in good shape here. Um, I know this is a little different from how we normally do. Uh, these frameworks and, and, and amendments that we work on where we select everything at the, at the last, you know, at, at the last meeting. Um, but hopefully everybody's clear on, uh, the actions that were taken in the past and previously. And as of today, uh, we already did vote to submit this to the national marine fishery service, uh, which will move forward in that, in that way. Um, Laurie, your hand's still up. Did you have to follow up or are you good right at this point? I'm good. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Jose or Chris, is there anything else that we need to bring up uh, before the council under this agenda item for this morning? Uh, not, not for Golden College. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so here, here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to go ahead and break for lunch, a little longer lunch than we normally have. Um, it'll give everybody a little bit of time to uh, 
to take a break uh, from the meetings that we've been in. Uh, those of you who are on ASMFC, where we met, you know, we had meetings all week last week as well. And um, I got a note from Chris Moore earlier that it'd be best if we started the um, Atlantic mackerel issues discussion uh, at one o'clock, given that people had that on their calendar and, and there's going to be a lot of interest in those discussions. So let's go ahead and break now uh, until 1 p.m. We'll come back and take up Atlantic mackerel. Thanks, everyone. See you in a bit.